have two very well-known speakers to this group and beyond. Dick Spotswood is the politics and government columnist for the Marin Independent Journal. His IJ columns appear every Sunday and Wednesday. A San Francisco native, Dick is former Mill Valley City Council member, 1980 through 92. Oh, sure. Did anyone happen to pick up something like this at the table? We're missing a sign-in sheet, yes. I guess. Mm -hmm. If you picked up a flyer and maybe got this by mistake, I don't know. All right. If it if it crops up, kindly let one of us know. It's just a it's a spreadsheet. Okay. So back to Mr. Spotswood, uh, San Francisco native, former former Mill Valley City Council member, three-term mayor as well, and a retired attorney. He served for ten years as director of the Golden Gate a director of the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District, representing. Marin's 11 cities and counties, uh, cities and towns, forgive me. Uh, Dick has just returned from a trip to Iowa where he was covering the uh, first in the nation presidential caucuses. Now, I'm curious, I saw a lot of coverage about the Democratic caucus. Was there a Republican caucus at all? There was. Highly contested, I assume, not. Donald Trump is a little the Republican former governor of the former governor of uh, Massachusetts. Last I saw, Trump had like ten with these crazy early numbers, ten thousand votes. Well, it was in the three hundreds. And uh, there's another guy who's a radio commentator, conservative radio commentator, but an anti-Trump guy named Joe. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Walsh. 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 Another member of mine that met with him, the person traveling with me, and he got about three hundred too. Wow. So it's ten thousand to three hundred to three hundred. So there you go. So <laughs> neck and neck. All right, well, he's going to tell, more, tell us more about that. Uh, now, Greg Brockbank, everybody knows Greg, is a self confessed political junkie in politics, having compiled candidate lists for over 20 years. He's a frequent speaker and writer. He appears frequently on public access TV to analyze and discuss local elections. Greg is a 30 year plus attorney, current principal of Marin Law Center. In case you need a lawyer, he's a good one. Senior member and past chair of the Marin Democratic Party, and he served on the boards of several dozen uh, civic and political organizations in Marin, including 22 years as an elected member of the College of Marin Board of Trustees, also on the San Rafael City Council. Uh, I invite you to welcome our, our two speakers. I'm going to turn it over to them, basically, and they will present uh, from their uh, seated positions, and then we'll open it up to questions when they're done. Please welcome our guests. Be here. You know, the, I heard the distinction uh, between Cornemere there and Belvedere. Every year I speak to the grand jury, and uh, the question comes up, what's the difference between a city and a town? Can you hear? How's that, better? Yeah. Every time I ask the grand jury, I ask, what's the difference between a city and a town? And I explain, a city is the center of vitality. Uh, people running around, cars, everything. It's just, you just feel like you're in Rome. And, and so I said, that's the city of... Uh, Belvedere. <laughs> but a town is just a little place where people just meander down the street and wave hi to each other in a neighborly manner. That's the city, that's the town of Tiburon. So you compare the city of Belvedere to the town of Tiburon and you'll understand the distinction, which in the law is no distinction. It simply sounded better to somebody in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when the dad came up to call some places towns. Very nice, but it has no legal meaning. So you're all in the same boat, good or bad. Well, bad, I just got back last night from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I had a chance, uh, I, this is my third caucus. It will probably be my last, not related to age, but related to my belief that you've just seen the last Iowa caucus uh, as a significant factor in American politics. Okay. It was a complete, well, we were sitting there at the uh, Marriott Hotel uh, with Amy Kobacher's uh, people just upstairs, uh, two blocks from the center, and we just left the caucus, which was, Typical for an Iowa Democratic caucus, there was 1,090 people present, uh, a younger crowd, and I was explaining that because that's in central Des Moines, where there's many, many, many insurance companies, and now many lofts and, and apartment houses for people who work in those insurance companies who tend to be younger. So there was 1,090 that came uh, to our caucus. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger caucuses in the state of Iowa. Uh, I will tell you that it was very interesting. Uh, only three candidates were viable. They've got 15%, uh, and where we stacked, you can see exactly the physicality of it all became obvious. 
uh, and that was uh, uh, went in this order, really. Pete Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard had a little sign. There was one person standing next to it. Uh, she's a congresswoman from, uh, from Hawaii who's going nowhere. I asked the local newscaster who we had dinner with, uh, WHO, in Des Moines, uh, what he made, what he, you know, he's a very experienced guy being a long time Iowa broadcaster, what he made of, uh, of Tulsi. He says, oh, he says, I think she's auditioning for Fox News, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> he says, she did a Democrat, she did a Democrat, they, you know, it work. Interesting. That was the best analysis I've heard of Tulsa Gabbard's campaign. Uh, we saw all the candidates individually. You get up front and close, it's easy, that's always the way. Anybody can do it. Uh, I had a press pass, but it doesn't change for the guy standing next to me. Um, a little different than last time, it was really between Hillary and, and, and uh, uh, well, the Republicans were really active last time. Yes. Well, and Hillary and Bernie. Uh, this time, Trump had just been to Iowa, just a day before I arrived. Uh, you know, it's so polarized. That none of the people, it's, it's gotten to a situation where in America, no Republicans, I listened to the State of the Union last night, partially on the way home from the airport, uh, no Republicans are making any appeals to the Democrats. And frankly, many Democrats aren't making any appeals to the Republicans. They are appealing to independents. So if you're a Republican and you don't hear anything you like from the Democrats, don't be surprised, they're not talking to you. And if you're a Democrat, don't be surprised if you don't hear anything from the Republicans, they're not talking to you. We've divided into two camps with a few of us in the middle. I'm a registered independent, uh, but I get to vote for the Democrat primary. Uh, what changed last night? A few things. First of all, other than the uh, Iowa Democratic Party's uh, worldwide, and there was worldwide press coverage there. The woman next to me when I was typing saw these column was from Reuters, uh, and that was just typical of the situation. Uh, my wife was interviewed by Swedish Broadcasting. She's part Swedish. Uh, and we were chatting with people in the elevator from Danish Broadcasting. Uh, so it was a worldwide phenomenon, and, and that's as it's been in the past. And, and, and Iowa to both parties value that. You may have seen the statement of Senator Grassley and Senator, what's your name, who's the right is it, like many, uh, the public moment from Iowa, Ernst. Jody, Jody Ernst, defended the Iowa Democrats last night. And because the Iowans, the most important thing isn't really the parties, it's keeping Iowa first in the nation because it makes them big shots. And they realized, many realized, there wasn't much in the record even today, the Moines record, that uh, Iowa's probably killed themselves. Um, it was complete incompetence. The, the caucus itself was typical, but I've written this in my paper before I left. It's very loosey-goosey. If you're sitting there, you see how loosey-goosey it is. The state of Iowa has no involvement whatsoever in the process. None. Zero. The parties run the processes. And so, you know, if you've ever been to a Democratic Central Committee, no offense, these are the guys that ran the operation. And when, when, when Rick Santorum really ran over, or won over Mitt Romney because they screwed up the last day, it was the Republican Central Committee that runs the operation. So you can't blame the, the good folks who are elected but run by the state of Iowa. It's the two parties that do this. Uh, and so it was a fiasco. Um, there, there are winners and losers in fiascos. Uh, I think Pete Buttigieg, who I think ultimately will come out first, is a winner. I mean, this guy has really gone far. I like to remind my friends from New York, and they remind me as well. Isn't it interesting that the mayor of the city of New York, de Blasio, is long gone, and nobody's ever heard of him. But the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, 100,000 people is on the rise. And the reason is one has talent. <laughs> uh, I mean, guess it's one that is. Uh, you'll see Pete Buttigieg, certainly in California. Uh, he won almost all rural Iowa. And I think that's a wonderful statement because people said to me before, he'll be dead in real Iowa. They'll never vote for a gay guy. They went right past it. Right past it. He does he got you know, problems. But they went right past it. We may have even in Iowa got over that prejudice. Well, that would be a good thing. Anyway, he did very well in rural area. The, the metropolitan area is burning. And labor, labor was very solid enough for Joe Biden. But Joe Biden probably comes in third, uh, excuse me, fourth. Elizabeth Warren will be third. And uh, uh, Amy Kobacher, who had a big decision, but, but did not qualify, at least in my person, uh, I think will make it to New Hampshire. It's going to have to think hard and long about coming to California. The big winner in all this, uh, and, and party activists just can't fathom this, so it's uh, you can, though, Mike Bloomberg. I think Mike Bloomberg is a big director on this because nobody comes out of, of, of Iowa. Pete should have. Mayor Pete should have. 
but uh, nobody comes out of Iowa with a strong push. Uh, if Bernie comes in strong in New Hampshire, everywhere to the right of Bernie, which is probably a good part of America, uh, it's going to say, we need somebody to stop Trump. And the guy who's got, he's already pledged one billion, and is a pledge to, uh, proposed to go to two billion, and frankly, I'm not going to go to three billion, uh, is somebody to be reckoned with. As um, it was on the Jimmy Fallon show, or I think it was Stephen Colbert, Bloomberg is who Trump pretends to be, you know, a self-made billionaire. Um, but they say with the experience, uh, I had a very good experience, I haven't done it once, but I've met experience with Bloomberg in that I spent a lot of time in New York City. It really got better when Mel uh, Bloomberg was mayor. It kind of fell off when the blossom came in. Uh, but the Bloomberg years were the golden years. You want to keep your eye on Bloomberg. You're going to see a lot of him. You're going to see a lot of him in, in every form of media that's available. Uh, and he's also ignoring the first state primaries. Probably a smart move. You know, why does he need to go to Iowa if he can spend $1 billion in California, which has, on uh, Super Tuesday, 40% of the delegates are elected. 40% are elected on Super Tuesday. Once California's over, you're going to really know who the finalists are. And let me remind you, that's 28 days away in a wake up. And you're all going to be able to play a role. If you are an independent like I am, and you want to vote in the Democratic primary, you need to ask for a ballot at the ballot place. They're not going to offer you one. You've got to ask verbally, I want a Democratic ballot. They'll give you one. If you want to vote absentee, it's more complicated. You have to contact the registrar's office. I point that out because it's very, nobody knows the rules. The Iowa problem was the Democrats really bent over to be backwards. They really bent over backwards to be fair. They really, it's typical. And what they did was they had a handbook for the folks which had something like 700 pages in it. They loved details. Uh, and the details would screw them up, despite a well-intentioned, really well-intentioned effort to be fair. It turned out into a fiasco. Enough about Iowa, but enough about the presidency. Greg. Thanks, Dick. I, I, hard to imagine a better way to start out than Iowa, which always captures the national imagination. But I agree with you that I think it's time has come and gone, and we may see the last one, both because caucuses are so inherently efficient. Four years ago, I went to Nevada and was a chair of a caucus. And you know, even if you're total political junkies like we are, and I assume most of you are, uh, you want to, the actual process of voting, you want to go in the polling place and vote and be out in 10 minutes. Why would you want to spend three or four hours plus parking, plus hanging around? Some people like to listen to their neighbors. Most people, I'm guessing, don't. Most people, I'm guessing, don't even know their neighbors. So what's the advantage of getting together? Oh, all my neighbors are on me. I don't recognize a single one. Uh, but So I, I, they've already eliminated, I think, this year, most of the caucuses, with the exception of Iowa and Nevada, uh, and a few, maybe one or two others. But I think the others will go, too. It's just primaries are just so much more efficient. And caucuses, like you say, are run by the state parties, not always as well as, say, Elections, primary elections, which are run by the states. Um, we will get back to the presidential race. Uh, I just figured we'd start with local, as I usually do in these for years, because uh, once we get into presidential, we'll, we'll never leave it. Um, how many of you are aware of the multi several? The last several years, we've been in the process of moving our local elected elections from odd numbered years to even numbered years. Y'all, y'all aware of that? Good. I won't belabor it. Uh, is and it's. It was for counties that had such a big difference in the percentage of turnout between uh, even number of years and odd number of years. And it's not that Marin's turnout numbers were so low in odd number of years, it's that they were so high in even number of years. So the difference was great enough that they forced Marin to move. And over the course of the last several years, we've been doing that. And last November was the last regularly scheduled uh, local election in Marin County, unless they changed the law again. They've all moved even numbered years starting this year. Um, they had their choice between the primary election, usually June this year, March, of course, next month, and November. Nearly all of them chose November. So March is not really a very big election. It's shocking how small it is. We all said, oh my god, we're going to die in March and November. No, we're not going to die in March because it's a small, usually small election. Uh, we can cover quickly, but November, get ready for November. Remember that there are... 19 elected school districts, 11 elected city councils, 20-something uh, uh, special districts. So those are, that's several dozen potential elections. Now many of them go uncontested, so maybe half or, or a third end up on the ballot. That's still a lot of elections to be on the ballot, on top of the stuff that's usually on the ballot in even number of years. Minor little things like the Water District Board and the Health Care District Board and all the partisan races. All the partisan races. So for this March, 
We only have the usual few that appear in the primary of even numbered years, and a couple of that have switched to March, but most of them November. Three counter supervisory races, as always. That's always been true. One of them's uncontested, as you probably know. It's District 2, Katie Rice. She's in for another term. Um, Kate Sears, as you know, is stepping down, retiring, and uh, there are three candidates to replace her, but the overwhelming front runner, even before Kate stepped down, and even before Stephanie Moulton Peters jumped in, is Stephanie Moulton Peters. She's been a Mill Valley Councilwoman, extremely well liked and respected for 12 years she's been serving. And I can't imagine she doesn't win overwhelmingly. That's always been true and still is. Her two, uh, the other two candidates are relatively unknown, Bill Bailey who's, uh, and Jack Kenny. Uh, I always, you can check out a candidate's chances immediately by, are they gonna raise money? Many of them don't. They're gonna lose. Are they gonna get a lot of endorsements? Many don't. They're gonna lose. Uh, are they gonna send out mailers? Many don't. And they're gonna lose with the exception of some kind of Nobel. Um, so I don't think it's a real contest. Uh, and finally, same with the final supervisor race, Dennis Rodoni, and I'll see what uh, Dick has to say. Uh, running for a second term, uh, reasonably popular and well-liked, unless you like golf and, and San Gerardo. <laughs> He's being challenged by Alex Lucy Brown, who's run for public office several times in the last decade or two, usually I think state assembly, but I, I think he's run for a supervisor once before. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy who admits, I'm not going to raise money, I'm not going to get endorsements, uh, I'm not going to send mailers. Okay, thank you very much for running, you're not going to win. But that's okay, you know, the democracy is definitely better off, and the other candidates are definitely better off, and the public is better off when there's a challenge. It's just a lot of these challenges are not serious in terms of the way you're winning. Dick. Yeah, thank you. Um, Katie Rice is on the post. <laughs> she's living the Ross Valley, uh, and she's done a good job. But let's move over to the third district. Uh, I don't disagree with any of uh, uh, Greg's analysis. I stand for the Peters will win in the third district. Um, the only fear is that she's, and I'm going to write about this, she's going to be uh, Kate Sears too. Um, and I'm not familiar with anything Kate Sears has done in the last 10 years, so that makes me so boring. Um, I want to suggest, give you a little hint, that uh, Kate simply, uh, when the Moulton Peters elected, resigned. Let the board appoint, or let the governor appoint, Stephanie get her to go and see if she can do something. My own opinion, I'm just disappointed that Kate has not uh, done anything other than vote along the majority or whatever the vote. Uh, initiatives, I, I just don't recall, she's very big on climate change. I haven't seen anything done about uh, sea level rise on the ground. I'm not interested in reports. I'm not interested in words. I'm interested in action. Uh, Kenny, interestingly enough, was the CIJ editorial board. And Brad, I never heard of the guy before. Brad Breithoff said to him, you know something about housing, don't you, Jack? Yeah, I said I built a thousand, I think 10,000 homes in a place called Carolinda. He built Carolinda. Mm -hmm. Interesting older guy, he's not going to campaign. The other guy, his name is uh, Bill Bailey. When I talked to him the first time, he was mostly interested in the Mill Valley School District, where he had some problems, of which the Board of Supervisors has no say. Uh, in the uh, Redonia District, the Redonia will win. Alex Easton Brown told me, I put the paper, the reason he's going to run, he's talking about running, was he believed that nobody else should run under post. It was a matter of philosophical belief. He's a former president of the United Taxpayers of Rent, uh, but a Democrat. And uh, would nobody file the last two or three days? Alex said, I guess I'm in. And that's why Alex is running. And I give him credit, because it makes Rodoni a better candidate to have an opponent. Uh, Rodoni's biggest problem, but I think we're going to overcome it, is the whole fiasco around the golf course. Interesting enough that the golfers have been huffing and puffing for two years about the disaster, which is the most of the actual, around the golf course, and they couldn't imagine to come up with, couldn't imagine, could, could have had the ability to come up with a candidate. And part of the reasons is the folks who make up the golfers. These are not people that go to campaign events, have coffees, donate, or even know much about politics at all, or care about it. Much less run for office. Much less run for office. And so they stay in it. Oh, great. Now you've got a problem. A supervisor just threw it. What are you going to do about it? Uh, we won't like them. Thanks a lot. They didn't do anything. So that's the impetus of, of certain groups that have been wounded by a candidate who took a shot and made a political decision that the other guys, the environmentalists, who go to campaign events, who, who, who run for office, who give coffee, who put up signs, who care, no of them were wrong. That's why. And the golfers think that, it still don't get it. 
I'm sure they don't know, understand why they, why they, nobody came up with it. But, but uh, yeah, about Rodonio, when that was his major fiasco, I, I think he hurt himself, he's still man, I think he just hurt himself because he wanted to bring people together. Uh, and I think he could have accomplished much of what he wanted to accomplish with a little more success and still be at the golf course. Um, you know, why am I, that's the great sin of America today. We're divided. Dick can't hear you. That's the great sin of America today, dividing us. So, uh, anyway, the three incumbents, and I consider uh, uh, Eastern Brown, um, excuse me, uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters, virtual incumbent, uh, will easily win. They need 50% to avoid a runoff. I predict they'll all get over 50%. Don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, that, although, you never know. I, four years ago, eight years ago, I look at the supervisor races as what is the level of anti incumbent fervor? That's what I call it. Sometimes it's very high. Can't hear it? <coughs> this is better? <laughs> I'm usually not told I can't be heard, but thank you all. Just be closer. So I, it's hard to gauge sometimes in advance the level of anti-incumbent fervor, as I call it. There have been times when incumbents on the Board of Supervisors have been beaten, and times when uh, or, or, or an incumbent got a much closer scare than everybody expected. There are other times when they thought it'd be a close race and it wasn't a close race, so the incumbents won handily. This is just in the last decade. So it depends on the level of anti-incumbent fervor, which I guess is reflected by how popular the decisions they're making are and how outraged people get. Let me just cover briefly a few city council races, only a few. Um, the usual ones, I think, were Ross and... Mm -hmm. But this year added were Mill Valley and Court of Madeira. They're not usually in even number of years. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, Court of Madeira got a free pass for two young new people. I don't know. Uh, Fred Casisa and Charles Lee, so they will not be on the ballot. Uh, Mill Valley is interesting. Has uh, three incumbents, uh, only one of whom is running for re-election, Sashi McEntee. One of them is running for a two-year term to uh, uh, finish the term of recently moved to Washington, D.C. for a new job, Jessica Jackson Sloan. And uh, that's, the, that's the vacancy. And the uh, other four candidates for three two-year seats, regular seats, on the Mill Valley City Council are Urban Carmel, who has served on dozens of boards, it seems like, very well-qualified, well-liked, and uh, is going to win big, almost unquestionably from what little I know. Yeah, you know, in Mill, Mill Valley is the only city that has an unofficial vetting board consisting of the former mayors. Dick is familiar with this because he's a member. There's like 19 of them. And whoever gets the most of them is going to win because they tell all their friends, and that's the most important method of campaigning. That's why maybe Mill Valley is the only place where a strong, successful candidate like Urban Carmel can probably be assured of winning, even though he says, I'm not going to do any mailers or yard signs. I don't want to pollute the neighborhood, and I don't want to pollute your mailboxes. So he's really relying on his personal connections and the connections of the former mayors. Uh, Trisha Osa, I don't know much about. Uh, Kirk Nauer, I think, is running a second time. I don't know that much about. Max Perret is a friend of mine. I have no idea how he'll do. He's only 28 years old, but he's been a political activist superstar for 12 years and has been awarded a, a, a graduate from London School of Economics or something. So he's an activist. I just don't know if he can overcome experience like that of Urban Carmel. And I don't know if he can beat Trisha Osa or Kirk Nauer. What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I know all five. I, I know all five. They're all. Uh, this is a mutual situation. All five are qualified. They're all talented, good, all talented, qualified people. All five. It's kind of an interesting situation. When you came to the IJ, I told them that. And I said, so how should we, the editorial board, or how should the voters decide among the five? Because they are all qualified, great talent, and and some of them. Uh, uh, Kirk Nauer, I didn't know much about before. Turns out to be an excellent person. Uh, I knew Max for a while. Max Perry. Uh, Trisha, emergency preparedness is their big deal. Very qualified people. Urban Carmel, by the way, did pledge no house signs, but what he meant was no house signs professionally made. They're all silk screened. <laughs> so they're all over the place. Uh, so it's, 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 <laughs> there's always an asterisk in politics. So, that uh, so that's, that's for Mill Valley. Uh, they, it is, they're very fortunate uh, that they have qualified people. Jim Wickham is very popular. He's a retired police lieutenant. And he'll run, he's running unopposed for the two-year seat. And uh, uh, I think this will be Jim's, it'll give him six years. There's usually a two-term limit in Mill Valley. It's part of the oral constitution. Uh, and Stephanie reminded me when she was elected in the third term, the last person that did that was me. So I was very forgiving. Uh, but three is it. Uh, if you can't do it in three terms, uh, you're not going to win. I don't care who you are. Because it's a very strong, and I can tell you, certainly the former mayor can think that's the correct situation. 
Um, not, that's my mind. I've been interviewed the people from Tim Ron and, and from Ross, but there's not much to say. I, I, just, people. I don't have much to say either. Ross Town Council has a, a, a contest. It's on the ballot, which is not all that usual. It has two incumbents out of three running for re-election, one stepping down. Elizabeth Breckus, I think, has served two terms. Paul Beach Kuehl, uh, uh, second term he's going for, I think, or maybe third. And three new candidates, Mary McFadden, Sina Shaku, and Charles Kircher. From what I hear, they're all perfectly fine candidates. Uh, pro incumbents usually win unless they're controversial or, or, or you have superstar challengers. And usually nobody has heard of them unless you're involved in local town affairs. And then hopefully you've heard of some of them. They don't come completely out of nowhere, just to us outsiders. Tiburon Town Council has a special election for a two year seat to uh, finish the term of, of a retiring council member. And three people are running for that two-year seat. Jack Ryan, who's run before, Daniel Amir, who I think I got, got narrowly endorsed by the IJ yesterday, and Kathleen DeFever, who, I think, who got the endorsement, I think, of the Democratic Party. The reason I want to mention two endorsements in these races, 90% of the time, I can think of a few exceptions, but they're very rare. You know very early in the season which candidates are going to win. The two biggest and I think most important and only countywide endorsements are the Democratic Central Committee of Marin and the Marin Women's Political Action Committee. They both send out questionnaires to everybody that qualifies. They both uh, review them. They have endorsements committee. They have candidates forums. And they endorse. Usually the same people get those both endorsements. If you get both those endorsements, you're almost certainly going to win. If you really try to get those endorsements and don't get them, you're almost certainly going to lose. So there's your early indicator in Marin County politics, those two organizations, the, the Democratic Senate Committee of Marin and the Women's Political Action Committee. Uh, Dick, anything? I would add the IK and I would add the CR Club. Those are both very important. I agree. Uh, I don't think in today's world uh, they mean what they once meant. Uh, period. I, I just don't think they do. Um, I mean, most people, how would they go? You know, I mean, they put out a flyer that they don't see. I, I take my son and his wife, San Rafael residents, as typical Marin voters. Um, presidential campaign, they're up to speed. They know exactly what's happening there. Congress, they can tell you everything Nancy Pelosi did in the last two weeks. City Council, eh, not so much. Special elections, nothing. Uh, they just, you know, they're typical homeowners, they have a child. Live in, the, live in San Rafael, but they're focused on the national stuff. And one of the things I wanted, I could tell you, it's obvious. People in this room say, oh, I'm very interested in Measure I, or Measure, measure, measure C. Well, welcome to the elite. Because most people aren't. That's not what they're talking about. Believe me, they're not talking about that. And the nuances of, of the smart train or uh, 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 school tax bonds, or they're going to react to those things, I'll tell you in a second. What they're interested in is, what the hell happened in Iowa? You know, that's what they're interested in. They're interested in the presidential election. It's sucking the air out of the room for good reason. And so, so among us, there's these great nuances. People go to the, these folks are going to vote, and they're going to vote by mail. Something like 75% of the people in Marin County are going to end up voting by mail. Our election's already started. People are casting ballots. I got an email yesterday, this morning, from a woman who already cast a ballot. So it's out there. And a lot of folks are going to make it you know, or a new, I should say, a lot of folks are new voters. When you have a high turnout year, and this is going to be a high turnout year, we're going to, we're going to be approaching the 90% level in November. These folks are interested in only one thing, Donald Trump in Iraq, period. And that's what they're following. And they're going to go to the ballot, and then they're going to see all this other stuff, and they're going to say, what do I know about fire? Am I worried about that? Yes or no? I'm not worried about the details. Schools. Do I like schools? Yeah, I got kids. Or no, I don't. Oh, wait, because you're a senior exemption. That's that's gonna be the stuff. That's smart training that gets gonna be an instinctive kind of thing. Republicans will instinctively vote no. Democrats who will be more predominant will tend to vote that. <coughs> because they vote for money issues. Republicans vote against money issues. Democrats vote for money issues. Yeah. Simplicity stuff is what happens when people are only not coming along the peripheral. There's a number that's gonna be able to see in March and you'll be able to follow it more intensely in November, which among inside political, real political insiders, is very important, the drop-off. You can tell right off, it's published in the state, by the county, the difference between the number of people that voted in the presidential election and the number of people that are gonna vote in the corner of town council election. And you'll be shocked at the number of people that don't vote in the lesser elections. 
But a lot of those people are interested to say, well, hell, I got on the coffee table. I got a mailer. Okay, one way or the other. Uh, there is a problem this year, though, I think where the Democrats have to face. There is a lot of tax overload on the ballot. We got a lot of tax issues out there. And a lot of people are starting to say, how much is too much? And so if I was the school people, or the smart people, or the fire people, I would say, yeah, we got a problem here. Those are two-thirds elections. And so that other third, you know, you've got 30% of the people going to vote no on everything. Maybe 40% of the people going to vote yes on everything. And in between, it's a decision. I uh, couldn't agree more. Two quick comments, and then let's get into those measures, because I think that's worth 10, 20 minutes. You're right, one of my favorite complaints every four years is why is it that seemingly the overwhelming majority of the populace doesn't care anything about politics except the presidential race? And everything suffers by comparison. That's one of the many reasons I thought moving our local elections to even number gears was a bad idea. They did it under the theory that, oh, I have all these other things on the ballot, I'll pay attention to them too, but I agree with Dick, they don't, they won't. They may say I've seen a flyer, I saw a commercial, whatever. And so we have more poorly informed voters uh, voting on things that they don't know that much about, if anything, and the candidates, the four candidates, are competing with many more vote, uh, candidates in other elections, so they can't raise as much money, they can't get as many volunteers, and the public suffers. Even the IJ, I'm sure, has limited space to write on politics, and so I think the local politics may suffer. Um, Ann Laser, of the League of Women Voters, a good friend of mine, uh, complained bitterly about the fact that this was a very bad idea because it will lead to more poorly informed voters and, uh, and it's, just, it's, it's a bad idea. We'll, we'll see in the next decade or two. As to the three local tax measures that I think are countywide and, and of great interest, I've got, what, five flyers in the first two days, yesterday and the day before, I assume everybody has. Um, the smart tax measure, the measure D on the San, San Geronimo Gulf, and the wildfire tax. There are some astounding differences. You know, there's various ways to be plugged in. We all learn our things in different ways. I'm very old-fashioned and low-tech, and I like to go to meetings and candidates forums and listen. Not as many as I used to, but still a lot. One of the best ones I went to was a League of Women Voters Forum about a month ago, where we had detailed presentations on the wildfire tax and on the smart tax. What a difference. The wildfire tax, you would think, would have a problem because it's a brand new, unprecedented, you know, and you're going to put this on the ballot and hope it'll win and, and risk all the people saying, wait a minute, don't we pay taxes for that anyway? That's in, becoming an increasing problem. But they're doing everything right. This is so, and, and people are so scared of fire, real, justifiably so, that I think this will win. It's only for 10 years. That seems like a short period of time, especially compared to the smart tax. And the smart tax, I think is a trouble. I, I originally support. I, I originally opposed the smart train. I don't admit that too much. Uh, for a decade or two, while it lost several times, La when it got on the ballot, Measure Q, two thousand, as a new council member, I was the only city council member that was on the uh, steering committee and the finance committee, and was on a panel that debated this. And I believed all the things we were told about it, like you know, oh, it'll, it won't block traffic in downtown Santa Fe. It's just like another stoplight. Well, I come onto the freeway every morning at rush hour, and sometimes it's a long wait, and sometimes two trains go by, and it takes those damn arms too long to go up and down, and traffic backs way, way up, and I hate it. So does everybody. Another reason I think SMART may lose support beyond the original group that supported it, which most of whom will support it again, and the original people that didn't like it, most of whom will continue to not like it, is the damn horn. Now, SMART got blamed wrongfully for the horrible noise that the horn made during testing. It's not their fault, it's a Federal Railroad Administration requirement that during testing they have to run this thing. Why they have to run it at night, I'm not quite so sure, but it drove everybody crazy. And there may be a lot of people that originally liked SMART, but now they don't like it anymore and it may lose for that reason, in my humble guess. Uh, and not to mention the fact that, let's see, you've been running for two years, the tax exp uh, expires in nine years, you want to extend it for 30 years already, even though it's true that the financial figures have always been and still are relatively dismal, and the ridership figures have always been are relatively dismal. The reason I still lean slightly towards supporting it is it's a great concept. It's a great idea. Having a train here. It's true that they don't usually succeed between two relatively small counties like Marin and Sonoma. But hey, we're special. We're Marin. We're part of Marin and Sonoma. We get to have our own train system. This is great. It's just expensive as hell. It takes a higher subsidy. But some people say, no way. It's not worth it. Others will say, absolutely, it's worth it. And if it's not worth it now, it will be in a decade or two. And I do believe that. I just did a 4% annual average growth. It could be a lot more riders in a decade or two. Uh, so anyway, that's that's where I am on the smart tax and the wildfire tax. And, uh, and Dick? 
Well, there's one other group you didn't mention, or I didn't mention, and I want to mention, is cost. Uh, the Coalition for Sustainable Tax Taxes. Uh, I think their endorsement's important. Uh, and the cost, first of all, they're more, they're more credible than most taxpayer organizations because they don't simply always say no. If you're a taxpayer organization that proposes every tax, who cares? Of course you're against it. And cost this time came out against the smart tax before the fire tax. And the fire people have the political sagacity to talk to the smart people, uh, the, the, the cost people, and one of the core items, key items, I don't think they call it core item, but their belief, is that taxes, uh, property taxes, should be based on square footage, not on a lot. In other words, somebody that has a, a little tiny cottage should pay the same as a shopping center. And the fire people bought it. And they, that's, you'll notice that the fire tax is based on square footage. It's not based on per lot. And the other thing they said is, Greg said the 10 years, but that was one of cost big items. These things shouldn't go up forever. We should have renewal with more frequency. And they said, yeah, that's a good idea. 10 years, Mark said, but the cost said, yeah, 10 years is reasonable. Why not against everything? So they're recommending yes on that. I think that gives the group great credibility. Uh, and, and, and the team, well, the, the, the uh, Democrats, they're always going to go for a Democrat candidate. Uh, I'm not sure the local office, that means much. Um, Mill Valley is a very liberal town. There are two Republicans out of five council members on the Mill Valley Council. I think one's a decline to stay two Democrats. Nobody knows which are which. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, so, you know, I'm not so sure. I remember when I was a councilman, the Democrats came to us and said, we're going to, I was a Democrat in those days. The Democrats are going to, the good news, the Central Committee is going to endorse candidates for city council. And I said, oh shit, don't do that. You're going to screw us up. We've got some guys in the roster, terrific. And they're going to lose if you endorse them. That's not true anymore, but it was then. And I said, I got a lot of friends from my Republicans. I don't want them to be doing this. Please, if you're going to endorse, take a pass on my town. And I don't, I don't think they did endorse. I don't recall to be endorsed by them. That's because I already told them. Uh, but I don't think so. Uh, I, I hate to say the Republicans do the same thing. It's not a Democrat thing. It's, it's a, I see the firefighters are now getting active. Oh, great. It's going to be like San Francisco. You know, where labor makes all the, makes the shots. If you think labor's doing this stuff because there's some issue, it's always about the wages and salaries and benefits and number of employees. It's always the same. San Francisco, Nevada's had a bit of that. Has done this for years. God, don't do it. Labor folks, right now you come to the table with great credibility. Why make enemies? Because you're going to make anybody who endorses makes an enemy unless the candidate wins. And I saw that in, in the firefighter somewhere, well, I don't want to fire. I haven't seen it. It's all a rumor. But I think that's a mistake. I just think that's a mistake. Uh, it certainly doesn't help the uh, effort to pass Measure C. It just be good enough. Uh, anyway, that's it for local. Let me just defend the right and the appropriateness of local political parties endorsing in what are obviously, admittedly, nonpartisan races like city councils. Uh, for a long time they did. For years, I go back to my over 30 years with this. And then they were prohibited from endorsing in nonpartisan races by a court decision. But that was overturned because why should everybody in the world be allowed to endorse but not political parties? So they, re, they, they returned to the political parties the right to endorse. Now, it is a little controversial. There's always a few people, even on the Democratic Central Committee of Emergency, should we really be doing this? Because we all, whether we've served in public or, uh, office or not, we know people from the other party that we like and we know are good uh, office holders, regardless of party. And I agree that most people don't know and don't care. But, being a member of a political party is shorthand for what your values are uh, in regards to labor, in regards to environmental protection, and in regards to a whole lot of things that sometimes come up, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, as a council member. Even though 90% of the time you're doing nonpartisan things, you get along fine with your colleagues regardless of party, and your party's not an issue. But as a baseline, I, I, all things else being equal, I think not just, there are many people, not just those on this Democratic Senate Committee, who would like to know whether that candidate is a Democrat or a Republican, and they further flesh that out by questionnaires asking their positions on various issues, and things like labor issues and environmental issues are important. I always look for a person who has, there's, there's some truth to that, because I always look for a person who is not registered with either party. I'm looking for an independent. I like that, it stands out to me, hey, <laughs> I like that. And there's a new party started, to Congress with Tom Campbell, it started, I think it's called the Common Sense Party, of a third party, fundamentally uh, disaffected Republicans. Uh, a major proponent, if you know San Francisco politics, and I had a 
bad luck to him about this, and is quite tough. Here's a very conservative guy who's not going to vote for Donald Trump because life depends on it. Uh, and so he wants the third way. In California, we effectively have one party right now. Look at the two races we have for Congress and Assembly coming up. This is a perfect example of the situation. There is effectively no Republican Party in California. Well, I mean, with Trump, I don't think they're coming back. What we need is a second, we need a two, if you have a two-party country, we need a two-party system. And a two-party system requires two parties that actively campaign and make a real pitch for the majority of voters and have a chance to win. And, and you know, when the Republicans, the moderate Republicans, and Bill Bagley comes to mind. He's no longer a Republican. Spent his life in the Republican Party. He's a very close friend of Richard Nixon's. He's declined to say I talk to him every week for 10 days. The, 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 what the California needs is a new center-right party. We have a fine center-left party, the Democrats, they, they, they're, they're doing what parties are supposed to do, and the Republicans are not, so we need a new center-left party. It's going to be for what we say labor, part? that are going to be for pension reform, that are going to go through the whole list of fiscal prudence. Uh, and the Republican brand has become tainted. We've covered two of the three countywide local ballot measures, tax measures I wanted to, or uh, I guess the San Gerardo Golf is not really a tax measure, but let's talk about that. It's, I, I agree with your initial comments that perhaps the pro-golf people that put on Measure D on the ballot are a little bit naive. They didn't realize what it took. They didn't realize the opposition they were gonna get. They, were gonna, they didn't realize they had no chance to win because they've kind of narrowed themselves into a very small group of people that are overwhelmingly outnumbered by the sheer firepower of the list of group endorsers and 50 elected officials and former elected officials. And what chance does a small group of uh, uh, not terribly politically sophisticated golfers have against that? The answer is not much. Well, I think that's true by putting a candidate on the ballot. I think when it comes to the golf course, it's kind of like the Richmond Bridge bike lane. <laughs> what do you need to hear more? to make up your mind. Not much. You put that issue on the Marine ballot, I think we can make a call on what's going to happen. You know, even the Marine Bicycle Coalition never even endorsed it. Their official position is, we don't oppose it. And one of them said to me, we don't want to waste our political capital on that. It's easy. You think that's a good idea? No. Easy vote. And the golf course deal is, you think the board supervisor did it right? Forget all the details of the zoning. That, that's the fundamental question. That's how you check the dog, right? Yeah, I think it was screwed up. I'm going to vote for it. I mean, I, you, you may have very basic kind of stuff. It's not due to some brilliant campaign on the part of uh, the golfers, because they, they, they were right. And, and they're not going to change. That's just who they are. But sometimes you can put things on the ballot. I used to suggest some issue now years ago. Good or bad, teleport to Marine General Hospital in, if you have a heart attack. If you live within a half mile there, you think bad. If you live more than a half mile, what do you think? Uh, yeah, easy. Uh, I actually suggested the Republicans do that one time. It was so relevant. And they said, yeah, interesting idea. Nothing ever happened. Um, yeah, people make gut decisions on things. And so if it's simple, fire. Simple. Fire. Let me make it easy. I mean, I said, uh, 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 Greg Bachbeck, a uh, wild, wild empire question. Greg, yes or no? Wildland fire good, wildland fire bad. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, two other things interesting about the smart tax we should mention. I don't know that either side expected a big bucks campaign. And they were both surprised, they were both wrong. It is a big bucks campaign because there's two unexpected donations in the last week we've read about. Uh, there's apparently a real estate developer, uh, Bill Gallagher in Sonoma County, Gallagher Homes, uh, that has a daughter who's the COO of the company or something, and she's politically active too, and uh, the daughter, Carol Slater, decided, I'm going to give $850,000 to the anti-smart tax uh, extension because I think this is a waste of money, and I'm going to save the people up from $2 billion in taxes or whatever it is. Okay, it was unexpected, a surprise, threw things for a loop, I think it made the loss even more assured until the next day when the great federated Indians of Great Rancheria said, fine then, we'll give a million to the pro-smart side. So both sides have these huge windfalls they hadn't expected. Carol Flater up around her, say now it's 850 something. Or, uh, so they're both at nearly a million dollars or at a million dollars, and who knows what that will do. More flyers, more TV ads, I know somebody who's in one of them, and uh, look out. Um, as for the, uh, there's a difference between, the IJ editorial I want to comment on, um, 
they said, well, smart is good. I like the concept. And we should have that. And we need it. And we do it. Yes, it would be yes, 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 yes. Except I think we'll urge a no vote now because it's a little early. And maybe in the future we'll do it. But now, no. The, uh, uh, first of all, they do put out a lot of stuff. I just was, got back in the mail. What do I find in my mailbox? A picture of myself. Uh, I do not endorse campaigns. The yes people put out a very nice picture of myself and a quote from my column. I appreciate the recognition, but I want to make it clear I do not endorse candidates or, or uh, and that was done without permission. Nobody asked. Um, usually they ask. I can tell you this, in Nevada one time I had a quote, one of the candidates wanted to know if they could run it. I said, sure, but you've got to run the whole sentence. It praised not only the candidate, but the candidate's lifelong enemy. Uh, let me just say something about the million dollars on each side on SMART. It has nothing to do with SMART. Uh, I'm sure that the, the Gallagher's really are po we're worried about tax overruns and efficiency. I, I don't doubt that. And I don't doubt that the Grant and Rancheria and, and Mr. Saris are concerned about the environment. It's sensible reason for both of them. I believe them. Coincidentally, just coincidentally, the no campaign to Gallagher is at war with the city of Santa Rosa, the city of, of, uh, of uh, town, excuse me, of uh, uh, Windsor, uh, and the Sonoma Board of Supervisors, and the Press Democrat. They hate the Press Democrat because they sued the Press Democrat for defamation, and the Court of Appeals ruled, well, if you tell the truth, it's not defamation, pay the attorney fees. They hate each other. So this is a way to push back and to say to them, screw around with us, this is what happens. Coincidence. Indians of Grand Sharia. They got a giant game going up there, and it's terrific. They're making money, hands over, good, good for them. But they want the city, the county, and the newspaper to know they can be helpful when they're needed. Hope you can be helpful when we need you. So that's politics. And so I believe both of them are worried about high rates, make it efficient, the other one, the environment. Coincidentally, just coincidentally, yeah, those other factors come into play. I thought uh, we'd be really worked up for the last 10, 20 minutes on presidential politics, but we're out of time and we want to leave lots of time for Q&A, so don't hesitate to ask uh, questions about predictions or thoughts about the presidential candidates, but that's where we started, maybe we'll end with it. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you all for coming. <laughs> Let's see some hands. Here we go. Do you have any opinions on, on the school board races, the, the, the school taxes? Oh, Nevada and, and Tammy. I, I live in the Tammy district, and I, I don't have an opinion on the Nevada tax. Um, I just haven't got deep enough into it. Tammy Union tax, they came to us for two years ago uh, for one tax, now they come back for another tax. You see, she shouldn't come to the well too often, in my opinion. Uh, and this is a continuation of the tax and a new tax. Somebody asked me, they came in, do you think a continuation of the tax is, isn't really a tax increase? It is. But for 50 years in this county, when school districts and special boards have come for continuing tax, we pretty much accepted it's the same tax. And yeah, it's like an amortized Morgan when you refinance. But when you ask for a new tax on top of a continuation of tax, there isn't any debate about that. I think they have a problem, mainly because of the just going to the well and the uh, tax overload. The tax, uh, too many taxes the whole time. I agree, tax overload is a problem, and it's going to get worse because everything's an even number of years now. And the best time to go out on the ballot for a tax is the presidential years, because more Democrats turn out, Democrats are more likely to vote yes. But what happens is they fill up the November presidential race with this, 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 and this, and everybody says, okay, that's enough anymore, and they're all gonna lose because there's a point at which they all say, pox on all your houses, and we'll vote no on all of them. So then March starts getting loaded, loaded up, the primary, and it has three or four big tax measures, and maybe it's too many already, too. Too many people wanna go out with too many taxes. I, I don't know that I have strong opinions about the school taxes either, other than I tend to vote for them but the process they go through is interesting. Sometimes they're incredibly well vetted. They think about these things month at me, the school board, and the administration. They think about these things well in advance. They anticipate all the obstacles, and they work with the community in advance. Let me give you one example. I say the League of Women Voters, because I've been active with them for a few years, go to a lot of meetings. And I think they're a key player in things like school taxes. Typically, they not only endorse school taxes, they will often sign the ballot measure, and there's no better ballot signer probably than the League of Women Voters. But once in a while, the campaigns screw up. They don't do their betting far enough in advance. They don't answer all the questions in advance. They don't come to the League of Women Voters far enough in advance, and they just expect the League of Women Voters to roll over and endorse it, and that's a mistake, because occasionally the League of Women Voters appropriately says, no, you know, you really haven't answered all our questions. You really haven't done all this, this so we're not gonna endorse this one. But typically they do, and typically they win. Yeah, um, as we know, SMART has never won in Marin County. It's never hit that two-thirds. Um, but with Sonoma being such a bigger population, 
Do you really think the vote in Marin is going to be uh, determinative, or is the smart issue really going to be decided basically in Sonoma? Um, I think Marin gets in the mid 60s to low 60s, and then Sonoma gets in the low 70s, and plus they have more people. So uh, a three or four point margin over the required 67% outweighs the five or six point loss below 67% in Marin. And, and I can see people resenting that, but that only if you, and I was thinking about this the other day, only if you feel that absolutely we need two thirds of Marin voters and two thirds of Sonoma voters. So you recall 20 years or so ago that Joe Nation, then Assemblyman, uh, had a bill to create one district. So it's two thirds of the total district, not two thirds in each county. There's some logic to saying that if I belong to a two county district, there ought to be a two thirds vote of the entire district and not require a two thirds vote in each county. Uh, I think the uh, big money in the campaign mushes everything up. And uh, uh, I'm not sure you're going to see a distinction between Marin and Sonoma. I think the taxes are is in trouble. You bet $2 million, people just tend to say there's something up. Uh, if you had no money spent and it was on a natural, I think it would pass. Uh, because the insiders and certain people that write emails, they're against. So I'm more interested in the folks that don't write emails. I learned that when uh, Bob Romier lost to, uh, what was his name? Uh, John Kit Kress. John Kress. Everybody that I knew was just, I was on television. I, everybody I knew figured that Romier was going to land, so I didn't remember that. Uh, and he had everybody that was all followers, you know, followers. And Kress had everybody that wasn't. Turns out a lot more of not, so I don't know. So I don't know. I think the $2 million screws up the whole thing as a, as a prognosticator. Uh, and maybe the whole thing in general. It's the evils of uh, Citizens United. And I think when the, when the first guys came out, or the Gallagher's came out, uh, the, we'd be told people about Citizens United, and the no people said, ah, what are you worried about that for? And the next day the Indians come out, and they're worried about Citizens United. You know, it's just, who's, 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 who's the side is burnt? The answer is it's bad in general. Well, money flooding politics. It's the American evil. Yeah. Topic for another Marine Coalition meeting. Yeah. Take, taking us back. To two uh, national questions, please. Dick, at your introduction, you you sort of indicated that Republicans aren't talking to Democrats, and Democrats aren't talking to Republicans. And I wonder if either of you has noticed that my man uh, Mayor Pete actually twice went on Fox News for hour long and was given standing ovations, and has often said in his stump speech, "I am appealing to uh, Democrats, Independents, and." Those who are former Republicans, okay? Oh. And if either of you've noticed that, and then the second question is, at what point uh, is Joe Biden going to really, truly be determined to be toast? And where do those middle votes uh, go? Well, uh, the answer is, I, I did see Mayor Pete, when you talk about former Republicans, I'm including them with the independents. So, oh, yes, the former Republicans are no longer Republicans, and most of them are transition to independence. I know that's probably pretty typical people I know in that category. Uh, the Mayor Pete certainly made that a pitch. Uh, I have to say that, uh, that uh, uh, Biden made the same pitch. I mean, up front, I was right standing right there for both of them. Uh, Mayor Pete did very well, very well. Sanders did very well. And so I see the beneficiary, I, I do see Biden with me and in, at some point in time. And I see the beneficiary of that you know, I like Mayor Pete, but I also like uh, Mike Bloomberg. So we got Mayor Pete and Mayor Mike. And so uh, you folks, we folks in California, will have much to say about what that means. California has a real problem. And let me warn you about this. And that is, in our effort, like the Democrats of Iowa, to be so encompassing and generous and fair, we cast ballots on election day right now. It's going to take two or three weeks for the California results to come. And okay, that'll happen in March. When that happens in November, and the election's close, it's going to be chaos. The rumors are going to be out. The conspiracy's out. Trump's going to say the whole thing's a fake. It didn't happen in the British election because they counted their votes right away. It didn't happen when I was a kid because they counted their votes right away. And this effort to be so fair and count them out and take three or four weeks like Sonoma County does, Sonoma's a disgrace. It takes four and a half weeks to get the results in Sonoma County. They don't even release inter intermediate votes. It leads to great speculation. So much for Santa Rosa City Council, but if you're running for president of the United States, speculation in this county, the country in November of 2002 can be fatal. I don't want to say it too strongly, but <laughs> I, uh, Pete, Pete Buttigieg, I think, was one of the surprises of the presidential race for me. When it first came out, I said, 
people tell me he's brilliant and he's so charismatic and he's so smart and he's so good and all this and this. I said, I too thought that, well, being gay could probably hurt him. Apparently not. Uh, he's so young, could probably hurt him. Apparently not. And he's only the mayor of a 100,000 population city. That should hurt him. Apparently not. Uh, but there are a lot of other reasons I don't like it. He's not progressive enough for me. You know who I'm supporting it, either Bernie or Elizabeth, but, and I go back and forth, to be honest. I, right now I'm back on Bernie. Um, Pete, I, I afraid, answers too much to the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, and his donations reflect that. He doesn't have the same policies that Bernie and Elizabeth do about the rejecting uh, certain donations. Uh, I think there is a huge crying need for a progressive candidate, which is why Bernie is currently in the lead, and why between he and Elizabeth, it's a huge number that, that between the two of them that support the two of them. Um, Biden, I've been writing articles for the Marin County Bar Association newsletter every couple of months last year, and it's always about the same top three or four or five candidates, and not much has changed, slight changes in the leadership, and uh, I kept thinking Pete Buttigieg would be a flash in the pan. I realized he was leading the Iowa caucuses a month ago, and I thought he fell back a little bit, but he won this week, so maybe he has not fallen back. Um, I, I still think it'll be Bernie, especially recently. He's leading in California, he's leading nationally, and Biden I've always called a fragile front runner. I, it, it wouldn't take much to make him fall, either uh, one or more or way too many gaps, which he is prone to, and it's always been a big liability for him, although God knows, one could argue that Trump gives 100 more gaps on his best day than Biden does on his worst day, and he doesn't need to be punished for it. Biden does, I, I don't know, it seems unfair. Uh, but I, I think it'll come down to uh, Bernie, Elizabeth, if she hangs in there, it's an odd pairing because if one of them drops out, the other would be the overwhelming front runner. But I, I just, I, Biden, if he goes, and I think he may, I think it'll help Buttigieg. Bloomberg, uh, I agree, could be strong, although Steyer's another billionaire. He hasn't got much traction, particularly in Iowa. And, and I just can't overcome the objection to uh, Bloomberg, when so many people, especially Democrats, are saying, hmm, didn't we just elect last time a New York billionaire? How'd that work out? Not so well. Why do we need another one for her in our party? I just, I, I just don't think that sells. I think you want to contrast the differences with uh, Trump, not the similarities. Is that Democrats will never elect an aristocrat to president. Maybe not even a man from an old Dutch family in the Hudson Valley. It will live in the family estate. Uh, who, I think they had four terms, four, four terms, three, three and, and, and unfortunately he passed away, but left it to Truman. Uh, I understand that Mayor Pete will be visiting the town of Corner Mayor very shortly. Am I correct? Yes. That's right. And I, uh, hopefully I can attend. I saw him in the South Bend. I'd love to see him at home. I like Mayor Pete. I think uh, he's a credible candidate. I think Biden's a credible candidate. I think Bloomberg's a credible candidate. I think Andy Kobachar's a credible candidate. Uh, Steyer, by the way, was at the airport. We hadn't seen him. He's sitting by himself doing a crossword puzzle. <laughs> Flying commercial and didn't have TSA, so we had to go through the line. He even flies his jet, I guess. Uh, and when people come up to him, he'd say, oh, hi, and go back to the crossword. <laughs> if you've ever, you ever met Joe Biden, that would not be Joe Biden, because he likes people. Elizabeth Warren is in the far edge of my uh, pale. I liked her when I started this time. I liked her. Bernie reminds me of two people I've had experiences with, per, not personal experience, but I know one of them we probably met from the old timers, and that's, uh, I was at the 68 convention. 68, uh, 68 convention, 72, when, when did George? Uh, uh, no, must, uh, yeah, but uh, McGovern too, I went to the McGovern convention. Reminds me of George McGovern, man of principle, a man of one state, Minnesota, the only state he won. And the other name that, 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 that Bernie Sanders reminds me of is a person until one month ago that you hope for the progressives of the world, a man that would sweep, sweep Britain and show them that the masses were for the people and for Jeremy Corbyn. So if you want to see Jeremy Corbyn in America and you want to see the Jeremy Corbyn result, Bernie Sanders will be the guy because the election is over before it starts. It, there is, well, there's a good side to this. The good side is if Bernie's the nominee, it will take care of the progressives for the next 30 years so we can get back to becoming a Democrat party. Bernie is hopeless. He cannot win. That, that did not come out four years ago when he ran it, almost beat Hillary for the, hit, beat Hillary for the nomination. It has not come out this year. I think he has already been vetted. I think his ideas have already been determined sound. I think he has already been showed by polls consistently to be able to beat Trump, because that's all people care about is who can beat Trump, uh, but almost as well as Biden. And, and if the difference is, 
I've heard of a milquetoast, lukewarm, moderate that most of us progressives don't really like or want versus a true progressive hero. We'll take a true progressive hero and hope he can beat Trump too, because I think he can. You're presuming we of that segment, the majority. And we're in. Very nice. And I predict the landslide for the Democrats in Marin County. The landslide, I stand by it. I don't care what you say. I stand by it. They're on the other hand, look that stuff out there. You know, you know, Jane Sanders introduced me. She's a lovely person. You get into the Jane Sanders background and you say, what the hell did she do in that college in Vermont? Where was that money going? You don't think they're going to start talking about that? Bernie's been soft love because nobody wants to touch him. Because they want his second, they want him to come over when he fizzles again. And if he doesn't fizzle, the two women who were spoke and introduced Biden in, 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 in Des Moines two days ago were the two women that flipped two Republican seats to Democrats <coughs> in, in the state of Iowa. One represents Des Moines. And they both said, we're for Biden, blah, 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 but we're also worried about who runs the top of the tickets because we can lose. My prediction, if, Joe, if, if, if Bernie Sanders is the Republican nominee, Nancy Pelosi isn't speaker. They lose the House. Forget the Senate. They lose the House. How's that feeling to you? I agree that because Bernie is so far left, he will be more polarizing. I agree that because he's so far left, he will get a smaller percentage of his agenda accomplished. But if nothing else we've learned in the last decade or two or three, and particularly the last three years, the power of the bully pulpit in the Oval Office is immense. You can do a lot with uh, executive orders. You can do a lot just speaking to the American people and moving that needle, and that's what we need. Even if Bernie Sanders gets 10 or 20 or 30, we should be so lucky. Of his agenda accomplished, he will have set the seeds, as he did four years ago when he started talking about single payer and nobody knew what it was, and now the whole country knows what it is, and most of them support it. Oh, uh, actually not. This is, this is, is what you came to see, folks. <laughs> This is the absurdity of Marine County, though, for one thing. Because, uh, and the big issues, Greg and I are not really tremendously far apart. You know, I, I, I tend to be, you're for Medicare for all? Yes. I'm for peace, Medicare for everyone who wants it. I mean, that's the <laughs> distinction. Yeah. That's a pretty, uh, in, in the Democratic Party, whether the manifesto is printed on blue paper or green paper is something you fight to the death of. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. <laughs> Sorry to drag you away from national, but I had a question uh, pertaining to the uh, fire issue. Um, when that was first introduced, there's two towns in Southern Marin, Belvedere and Tiburon, who have opted out uh, of this tax because they have already begun uh, many of those measures which the tax is purported to cover, like um, checking all residential properties for bad vegetation all that. So how do uh, voters in these two uh, precincts, how do they uh, mark their ballot? Do they just put not, no? No, it's not on the ballot. Or just nothing? Uh, it's not on the ballot. Uh, isn't there a fire issue measure? I don't think there's those two issues for the Belvedere Fire Protection, is it Tim Rock Fire Protection District? It's true that they opted out. I just assumed it was on the ballot. No, 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 no. Should, why should they no, 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 I'm not saying that's on the ballot. I'm saying there is a Voting for this wildfire tax. No, that's not on the bill. In those two towns. There's no measure about the tax? I don't believe so. Right. Well, Holly, where's Holly? Just Holly's still here? Down here. Holly, is that on the ballot in Tiburon? Is one of the ballots. Is your seat? Measure seat. The fire tax. Right. No. So, so in part of Tiburon, it is. So, oh, well, if it's right. covered by Southern Marin, it yeah. is on But if it's in the, tire, it's in the ballot in the Tiburon Fire Protection District. No. Okay, so that part of. No. Part of Tiburon is serviced by Southern Marin Fire Station. I'm only talking about the Fire Protection District, though, the Tiburon Fire Protection District. Okay, Tiburon Fire Protection District, no, because they're not a signer. Right. So that's, that's the answer to the question. Yeah, She's yeah. a Tiburon Councilwoman. By the way, uh, if that fire comes over the hill from Corte Madera, I'm sure they'll be protected. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that that's, you take care of yourself, and I respect that. And with global, with global climate change and sea level rise, I hope the people of the Tiburon Fire Protection District don't expect the taxpayers in Ross to help them out on that. I'm sure they're willing to stand on their own two feet and take care of that as well. I, I hope that there's no hard feelings anywhere. My guess, this is just a guess, is that eventually, I don't know if it'll take five or ten years, those two districts have said, no, we can do this on our own, we're all already doing that. Good for them. They deserve credit for that. And I can understand 
the city leaders and the voters saying, why should we pay a tax to do something that we were already doing in funding? But my guess is after they've done it a few years and they realize they're running their own little operation and they're not as coordinated as they could and should be with the rest of the county, they'll decide, maybe we should join that after all. It would be more efficient. You might ask yourself the question of why we have so many fire districts. Good question. <laughs> there have been some consolidations. There could be a few more, especially in the fire district. By the way, people complain about that all the time, like we have 19 school districts in Marin. I've heard Mary Jane Burr give some speeches in the last five or 10 years talking about how when we used to have 54 school districts in Marin, and we consolidated and consolidated and consolidated and consolidated. So getting down to 19 is actually a low number compared to what we used to have a few decades ago. And Sonoma has twice as many as we have. But fire districts, yes, consolidated. While you're all thinking, I've got a question here about one of the comments one of you gentlemen made about the fact that this is California. There is essentially, for all intents and purposes, no longer a Republican Party here. Uh, and I don't, I don't uh, take issue with that. In fact, I think that's probably true in other parts of the country where there's no Democrat Party. And so essentially, uh, you know, we're looking at a civil war kind of situation here. You've got areas of the country that are thinking one way overwhelmingly, other areas that are thinking overwhelmingly in a different vein. And this is what we see in our national discussion, our national conversation on a daily basis. It's, it's polarization one-on-one. Um, I don't really have a question. I'm just wondering if you have observations. I, I think that's the way it is. I, mean, I guess the question is, is there any way out of it? Well, we were in this situation one time before. Yes. Late 1850s. <laughs> In the late 1850s, it did not work out well, uh, and I don't see. I see very strong similarities. Much of what's happening in the world today, we can see strong similarities. Talk about foreign policy, we can see strong similarities in Europe with the rise of fascism in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and I see this this polarization, such the, the, some people call it the Great Realignment, where people move to places where they feel more comfortable. In the long term, you know, unfortunately, I'm not going to be around here to see it. But I think in 20, 30 years, if it continues in this line, uh, we've got some big problems, uh, big problems. You know, uh, my wife says you get in your dark mood. I won't get there, but I'm just going to say it didn't work out well last time. That was regional. That was over issues like slavery. And that uh, was precipitating a, a, a civil war because the country was only 90 years old. And some people felt, OK, if the whole country could break away from England 90 years earlier, we can break away from this 90-year-old country and form our own southern country. It's not inherently outrageous. It happens all the time. Uh, whereas uh, the northerners said, no, it's worth preserving this country no matter what. Abe Lincoln will be memorialized forever, one of the greatest leaders. And there's some truth to that. I don't see us getting to that point, but I see us getting to similar points and similar flashpoints and similar divisions for a different reason. Income inequality. I've been saying it for a decade or two this. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. There's a limit to that. Pretty soon, people will start talking about revolution, and most of us don't want that. So we better work on income equality and not just say, hey, no, I earned this by God or I inherited it or I, you know, um, I, I, I'm entitled to every penny of this and those poor suckers uh, let us struggle. No, that's your asking for revolution. Okay, we have a question over here. Any comments about uh, Trump not uh, offering his speech to Nancy Pelosi first, rather giving it to the beat first, and not shaking her hand, coupled with that on the back end of Nancy turning his speech up? First of all, let me just say with the Democrats, there's a letter in today's New York Times, which is going to be on the newsletter for the quote of the week. Let's get back to the old smoke-filled rooms. We've talked about that. Uh, if the old smoke-filled rooms were operating, we might be better off. I tell you who the most qualified Democratic presidential candidate would be, and I think would be, most Democrats would say yes. Republicans would say no, but they're never going to say yes to it. It, 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 any Democrat, you know. Uh, that's Nancy Pelosi. You know, she's, he's terrified of her, and she's not terrified of him. And he, she look, some of these guys, well, she looks him in the eye, and he says, oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. And, and, and she's quite confident. She's smart. And you know, everybody says, oh, Bernie and Biden, they're 77 years old. Nancy Pelosi's 79 years old. Nobody says anything about it because it doesn't show. And so I think a 79-year-old lady from San Francisco might be a good thing. And she's not her mind, I don't think. But if the smoke full rooms are around, they call her in and say, Nancy, we made a decision. It's you. 
and we're going to come up with the same. You're running late in about five minutes. And they might say, Mayor Pete, yes. come on in. Or they might say, Amy Kobusher, come on in. Now they might say, you know, you can come up with your own list. But wouldn't that be an interesting thing? Um, I told somebody just before the lunch here started that I think both were being a little petty. Um, I, my understanding is that the speaker and the vice president always get copies, so this is not new that they got a copy. So they had, she had a copy there, and, and it was a really meaningless gesture. It's not like they're on copy center, but she wanted to do it in front of everybody because he refused to shake her hand. Did he not see her? I, it seems hard to believe, but yeah. <sighs> that's not what he did. That's not what she tore it up. I don't believe. You don't think it's retaliation? No, not for that. She thought it was a bunch of punk. I understand why she thought that, you know, okay. We're the best we've ever been for the following 29 reasons. And, and what country are you living in? The other thing I saw about the State of the Union, and, and, and this, is, this has been one of those things that's morphed. And if, and if you told Washington or Jefferson or Lincoln that people would be bringing people to the, uh, the stage, as it were, you know, we have a three-year-old child here, you know, they, they would have thought you were absurd. The Democrats have done it as well. Reagan started it, a very minor one issue. Now it's become a, 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 a political act. Yeah. Uh, and I thought some of these people, they were being exploited. Yeah, I mean, exploitation was the only word I can think of. And I think that's, that's but the Americans, you know, they're used to this on television, I guess. Uh, I was offended by it. And I think the Democrats, but the trouble is, it's, you start a war of this attrition. The Democrats, not attrition, but your war of, of, of rising expectations. So that, that's something they have a three year old. The Democrats have a two year old. I mean, what is it? <laughs> I agree, and Rush Limbaugh is a classic example of that. I, people that have been awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor have all been universally admired people by people of both parties. You don't just say, oh, by the way, Rush Limbaugh up there is in a cheer, and you know, read me to the crowd. And, and by the way, Melania put a little thing around his neck, and now he's got the Presidential Medal for you. What happened to the dignity and the solemnity of that honor, of that award, of the bipartisanship? What dimension? Okay, question over here. Yes, I'd like to... Uh, Bring it back home here for a second and have your views on Proposition 13 and some clarity on 13. I've had some friends say that it doesn't going to have any impact on our property taxes and others that say uh, different. Let me say in two words, so let's pray for the soul of Howard Sharps. <laughs> yes. uh, I look at my property tax bill and say I can stay in my house. And I look at what a new person would pay for that property tax bill and I say, holy moly, that's so? Property tax is Sunday in the New York Times business section. They have three properties at the same price. It's very interesting to look around the country and see where the property taxes are. You also have to box that in with the, with the income taxes, of course. Uh, the big issue is the split roll. Uh, anybody want to suggest? Uh, I don't care if it's Bernie Sanders. Bernie, stand up. You're in favor of getting rid of Prop 13 for homeowners in the state of California? Please tell me, Bernie, before March 3rd. Not for homeowners, but for residential. No, I'm not still. I'm being a commercial properties. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as a homeowner, what do you think about that, Bernie? Uh, third rail. No, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> But, but Democrats have been talking about this for years. They called it split role. Uh, last year, the League of Women Voters started a major campaign called Make It Fair. Unfortunately, it's had too many names, and the current one is not any better. It's a mouthful. Schools and communities first. And they had it on the ballot ready last year, and then they wanted to tweak it slightly, so we have to start all over and get signatures again. But it's doing a good thing. Uh, originally, it was like 60-40. Uh, most taxes were paid by commercial property owners and 40% by residential. That's flipped now, 60% of property taxes are paid by residential because they turn over at a regular basis, so they keep going up at a regular basis. Most commercial properties don't. So despite the scare tactics that you've heard about that this measure, which will be on the November ballot, not March, uh, that will increase your home's property taxes, it will not. It is specifically and uh, conclusively and uh, ex exempt. So it's only commercial properties which do not get reassessed uh, regularly because they're usually held in the same name, even though they may pass from corporation to corporation, there's ways to do it so that it doesn't trigger a reassessment. This will trigger reassessments every few years of commercial properties and bring a bunch of new money into the system. Schools will have enough money, at least for a little while, for a few years, for the first time in decades, if not ever. And so will local cities. So it is an influx of money for people that have been undertaxed for a decade or two or three ever since Prop 13 passed. The uh, worry, of course, is that as Greg says, the money will be good for the schools and everything for two for a little time. And then they say, now we need some more. And that's when they get rid of the homeless this country. So that's the worry. Uh, you know, I, mean, I tend to think uh, there's a lot of money on the table already. How you allocate is a good question. Uh, and certainly, uh, I don't hear any calls for uh, pension reform. 
public police commission. Okay, question over here. Yeah, I guess following up on that, I, uh, I'm one of those Democrats who tends to vote yes on all the spending things, which is fine. Uh, but I, I must say I'm a little frustrated at the explanations we get for, for what our, where our money's going. You know, when you build a smart train, that's a new project. I understand I need new money for that. Or you build a new firehouse, okay, that's a new project. But with schools, for example, I love schools, if we have a, presumably there's maintenance built into having schools, and we pay a whole lot of money in property taxes. So why do we need a bond measure to remove asbestos or uh, refurbish uh, junior high school? Isn't that part of what we're already paying for with our property taxes? I, I, I'm never quite sure what's going on. And similarly, with the wildfire tax, I don't want my home to burn up. Nobody here does. It's obviously a big issue. But if you start calculating the cost for you and your property tax, it's a whole lot of money, which is okay, but don't our taxes normally pay for a fair amount of fire prevention work or, or cleaning up the forest or all the other things that presumably taxes would cover? Isn't some of that covered already? And, and if it isn't, okay, but how about if the ballot measures explain what is covered now and what isn't covered, so at least we'll understand it better. Ideally, yes. Normally, yes. And that's why there is, in fact, I referenced earlier, growing frustration uh, by taxpayers generally, particularly conservative anti-tax ones, against what some people call a la carte taxes. And I agree, it's an offensive concept. If you think of local elected officials as sitting around scheming, say, how can we get more money out of the public? And some people think they do that. I don't think they do. But uh, what they do is, Every year they make tough budget decisions. Every year things have come up, oh, that's a good program, that's a good program, that's good, oh, we gotta keep that, gotta keep that, uh-oh, we're over budget. Well, we gotta cut. So they cut something because they fund things that they think are more effective and better. And this happens every year in every agency at some level or another. So pretty soon they're short on some things and they've been cutting some things for a while and they'd like to bring some of those back and people start screaming louder and louder, what about the arts program, what about this, what about that? Our facilities are falling apart. That's why virtually every school district, especially in Marin, have had a partial tax every five or 10 years, most of that several, and or a bond measure to fix up the facilities every five or 10 years, again, most of that several. And how can you blame anybody for that? It's mostly parents wanting a better education and better facilities for their children. So they fight for that, they argue for that, they demand that the school board put a measure on the ballot, and they do. So why are local elected officials to blame? They're certainly not scheming to extract excessive tax revenue from people. Yes, our local property taxes do go up because there are more and more partial taxes and, 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 and uh, bond measures. But uh, this is what people want, especially in a wealthy community like Marin, they can mostly afford to pay more taxes for better schools. I don't always vote yes. When I look out the window right now and I see this dead tree right here. And I know what a spark storm can do. And I know that there's nothing in most of the fire department's budgets to clear brush. We need mass, look at, when you drive out of here, look up the hills. If the more you spend on this, it scares the hell out of you. It just scares the hell out of you. I'm reading a book now called The Ostrich Paradox. <laughs> the Ostrich Paradox is, and it doesn't deal with fire only, it deals with uh, 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 sea level rise, hurricanes, flooding, earthquake, any natural disaster in the United States. And the same phenomenon always happens. I've been a city manager in the city of Mill Valley who said you have a one year after a disaster. That's when it's time to fix and uh, to do something. If you wait longer, people will come up with a zillion excuses not to do anything because that's old history. Uh, the Ross Valley Flood being the perfect example. They beat the Panama Canal, uh, built the Panama Canal in far less time with, with, the, with the yellow fever uh, to boot than has been done on, uh, on Ross Valley Flood. Um, the, the truth of the matter is just cleaning the toxics from your property after the fire. Just, people forgot about that. The huge cost to clean the toxics in Santa Rosa will be outstanding. It, it makes all this stuff looks like peanuts. Forget about rebuilding. Forget about where you're going to live. Forget about the disruption of your life. Just clean the toxics off your own property, which the feds are not picking up. I read the Press Democrat every day. You should see what those poor son of a guns are going. There's a book, a cartoonist on Sonoma called A Fire Story. I gave it to every member of the Mill Valley City Council. I handed them out. It, you know, we haven't even talked about so many other issues, but it, 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 it's going to come. Grand jury says when, not if. And so what, what, I, I suspect We'll do what we always do. Well, we come up with a better proposal. You know, I mean, you've got a situation where the taxpayer groups that vote for it. I mean, that's saying a lot. 
so I, you know, and if, if, by the way, if the fire comes, nobody's going to say, oh, I guess I didn't do my part. They're going to say the same thing. It's somebody else's fault. Why didn't they do it? It's the city, the government, the PG&E, Trump. Uh, uh, uh. Or Nancy Pelosi, if you will. It's all her fault. Well, sometimes we all need to stay. When you find a person that says, it's my fault, it's my responsibility, it's my duty, I tell people to do three things. Marry them, lend them money, make them a business partner. You finally found somebody who's smart, and you are doing the right thing. We don't care that they're off. All right, time for maybe one more question. Anybody? Over here. Oh, okay. I'm always amazed about the enthusiasm um, in the Trump camp because I don't feel as though he's really done much for his base to improve their lives and make them better. That's just an observation, although I'm, I'm interested if I'm missing something about what he's done and I guess that's the scary part that he keeps that momentum going with his base, that enthusiasm, despite the fact that their pocketbooks and their lives haven't gotten better. And my second question, my question is, um, the Electoral College, uh, is that, do we just give up on that? And that's just a, a foregone conclusion, we're always going to have it? As to why Trump supporters support him, that is indeed a great mystery which many of us, maybe most of us, have spent thousands of hours every week thinking about and can't figure it out. Um, I, my recent theory every week is different, is that you know people are so frustrated with our dysfunctional politics, they say, I guess we need a tough SOB to be president, and they think of Trump as a tough SOB. I don't think he's tough, he's definitely not an SOB, I think we don't all agree on that. But I, that's the only thing I can think of, they think politics is broken, so we need to blow up the boxes. Remember they said the same thing about Schwarzenegger 20 years ago in California. They wanted Trump to come in and blow up the boxes, and he has been to some degree. I agree with you, he hasn't really accomplished that much. His signature legislation, the tax cut, the old tax cut for everyone, no, but no, it's not for the middle class, it's for rich people and corporations. Uh, I think something that's very hard for the progressives to grasp, because there's always going to be a better, you know, higher minimum wage. But much of this division in this country is not about ideology. It's about sociology. It's about how people look at each other. Jerry Brown, I'll give you a quote from the Washington Post. Jerry Brown, who tends to be a pretty perceptive guy, even in his old age, quote, Trump has turned the border wall into a metaphor. He's basically saying, hey, those lefties and socialists are against it. I'm for it, and it's protection. And somehow, that will protect you from closing down the factory or protecting you from these strange social experiments. So it's a metaphor. Nobody really thinks, I don't think anybody thinks the water wall's going to do anything. But it's a statement. And in all of these statements, they know that if these people out here, even the more conservative, I have a friend who's moved to Louisiana, he's a pretty conservative Republican. He says, I'm the most liberal guy in town. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the rural Louisiana outside of New Orleans. Uh, it, it's about how they perceive, we perceive each other. I mean, we look at some folks over there and we say, we don't like those guys. They look at some folks over here and say, that we don't like those guys. It's sociological, it's a resentment. I mean, if you're living in a, in a poor town and you see some guys in San Francisco, you know, the average wage in the tech industry, we always complain about people don't pay high enough. Average wage is $200,000. That's, you know, that's, that's not expired. That's why the rate of housing costs are so high. Everybody didn't pay well. The mayor of Los Altos said the problem this town has is something no other town in America has. Too many good paying jobs. It wasn't enough cost of housing and everything else up. Yeah, well, that's, that happens. I think it's more sociology than more the ideology. And God knows that's harder to deal with. A quick question on the electoral, point on the electoral vote. I don't know anyone optimistic that we can change the Constitution to eliminate the electoral vote and replace it with a winner popular vote. But there's something called the National Popular Vote Compact. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's slowly gained traction in the last few years. States can, if they wish, have their legislature pass since states are uniquely in charge of distributing their electoral votes as they see fit. And if a state legislature was to decide, we will award all our electoral votes, whoever wins that state, to the winner of the national popular vote, they will have done a workaround and made the electoral vote irrelevant if we get half the state, the states representing half the population, to agree to this. California has, and a, and a dozen or two other states. It's not half yet, but we're getting close. That'll make the electoral vote uh, ir irrelevant. I'll finish with giving you something you didn't think you had to worry about until now, because you didn't have enough to worry about. The faithless elector. The faithless elector is a phenomenon that's occurred before where a person comes from a state 
whether or not the state requires her or not to vote for the candidate who wins the majority of the vote. And the elector decides, because they woke up that morning and said, I know better, to vote for somebody else. Suppose you have a very, very close Florida style, even closer election, where there's two or three faithless electors that go against the will of the people to their state. Then what do you do? The answer is you're in big, big trouble. The founders never, the founders were against political parties. And you know, the electoral state, I, I was in, uh, I was in Council Bluffs, Iowa, four, year, four years ago, listening to Donald Trump, good experience. He said, you know, the founders of this country, they never compromised. And I thought to myself, the whole Constitution is a compromise. Big states, small states, House, Senate, electoral votes, the whole thing is a compromise. And Americans, the people would vote, they never compromised. Well, the whole deal, the only way the place works, a city, a county, a school district, a state, a nation, or a, a world works, is compromise. And if you don't compromise, it's not going to work out. Yeah, I promise one more question. Hello, uh, your remarks about Pelosi was much appreciated. I was kind of amazed that Obama says it's time for a woman president. Yet so little was time. Was Elizabeth Warren is third in the in the going into New Hampshire. She's steady and she's the only one I know that can take him on television and because she's intellectual, more intellectual than he is, certainly verbally better. And I really encourage that or and the other one is Amy who can bring in the, the uh, states, the swing states. So oh. I, I kind of kind of upset you didn't really. Well, that's why she more time stepped time. up in my mind when I saw her, because she, she, she came across that way to me when, she, when I saw her up front in person. I uh, that you, you, you're presuming something that's a fact, not an evidence, as we say in the legal business, uh, that Trump will actually show up to a debate. <laughs> well, well, why do you presume that? Why do I think, oh, because she's right? No, no, why do I presume that Trump will show up? He won't want to debate anybody. He may He'll not. say the rules are rigged. Oh, it's I on see. a Tuesday and on a Thursday. Uh, 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 who knows? But I'd be very surprised he shows up in debates. He doesn't do well, and he doesn't like to show up at venues where he doesn't do well. I disagree. I think his ego is such the he cannot resist. Well, that's the other oh. that's the <laughs> I think he's got a golf game that day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We, we have to cut it. I, I think we could go on all day. Yes. Thank you. I want to thank our speakers. I also want to thank all of you for bringing this discussion to an even higher level. This was great. I think this was one of our best programs ever. You guys, you knock it out of the park every time. We want to thank you. Don't forget your wine. Uh, hopefully we'll see many of you next month, March 4, to hear Susan talk about her issues. Thank you for coming.